There are two situations in which a country might set aside your rights in the democratic landscape, in either sections of it or even all of the country. The first is the existence of threats for the national security, the second are disasters or imminent disasters which necessitate the creation of measures to prevent, limit or eliminate their effects. The fundamental freedoms written in your constitution may be restrained only if it is strictly necessary and according to the gravity of the situation. These emergency states usually last up to 30 days, but if the situation is the same, they can extend it even longer, similarly to the procedures when a war takes place. Any democratic country that does this needs to specify the exact reasons for the emergency state, the area in which it will be established, the period of time, and the rights and fundamental freedoms that are being restrained. Now, The details to how this whole thing is applied is specific to every country the rights that are going to be removed will be similar. You'll basically not own yourself anymore. You will lose all your privacy. You won't be independent anymore. Authorities can raid you whenever they want. They can probe you wherever they want. You don't have the freedom of travel. In fact, you don't have the freedom to move at all, except if you are allowed to by signing a paper to say that you are going out to buy bread and return in 20 minutes. Authorities can relocate you. They can ban all traffic. They can take over the shops and tell them how much they are allowed to sell and when to sell it. They will establish communist-style rations. They can stop the restaurants, coffee shops, clubs and all other public places, forbid public gatherings of any kind, freedom of the press will be removed, the government can take over the media completely and that includes both TV and radio stations. All transport will be stopped as well, no cars, no trains, no ships. The only transport you will see is if you need to be evacuated to another quarantine area, or strict established paths to go to the rations shop. The army can treat you like a dog if you don't obey, and when people die there won't be any goodbyes or any funerals. In fact, this is already happening in Italy where churches have become depots for bodies because there is no more room in the hospitals. This is unfortunately the new dystopian reality. Not to mention, from now on you need to inject in your body whatever they will say to guarantee your survival and the safety of others. If you do not inject, then you are a traitor of the country and will be removed. You will say it's all good because it's all done in the interest of the people, right? The governments are all working to heal us all. I mean sure, you can believe that if you want, but I don't believe that the current system is run by very humanistic honorable people. It is run by psychopaths and opportunists, and what better opportunity to gain more power than this coronavirus situation. I am of course making assumptions, but I don't trust any of them, and I think the safety of the public is somewhere around the middle of their priority list. The first things are of course what they can do to benefit themselves, or the members of their party. After recession times, there are always those who end up way richer than before the recession. So I would say, to stay vigilant about these things, the people who lead countries are not exactly saints. So when I look at these people singing on the quarantine streets of Italy, I don't know if it actually makes me happy because they have not lost hope, or sad because they don't realize in what horrible dystopian predicament they are in. We have to look objectively at what our life is right now. No matter how much you tell me that this is for my safety, I can't get used to walking to a shop and stay at this line where I have to keep a 2 meter distance from the next person. It's so strange to look at people not talking to each other and avoiding each other, living in constant fear. It wasn't enough that we have already alienated ourselves with the smartphone age, now we have this. A complete police state where everyone is scared of one another. This again reminds me of my own Soviet Romania back in the 80s, but at least people were talking with each other. However, they were scared about the topics discussed because any citizen could report another citizen to the thought police, and you would be put in jail or a working camp for having the wrong thoughts. It's okay, now they found an even better solution for us, and that is to not talk at all. Sure we have the internet, but what if even this goes away? Also, remember we are human beings, a lot of our communication and interaction is done through body language. This uh, text and an electrical interpretation of what your voice and face looks like is not enough. We are going to lose a lot through this, 
We are losing fundamentally important parts of our humanity. Some people will lose relationships, other people won't be able to create families, some people will lose their minds, and other people will become more dehumanized than they already were. An important question is what is the length of this emergency state? Do we have to sit in our rooms for a couple of months, or for a year until the vaccine is ready? Or will we have to stay for even more time because the virus has mutated in a lot of different ways and the vaccine needs to be redone, which will generate even more dehumanization and even more money for the vax companies. I don't really see our leaders even mentioning about the loss of human rights and how much they are sorry for that. It's like no one even cares about that because of the mass psychosis of how this is the right thing to do. I've only seen one or two independent media people talking about this in my country. All the mainstream is just parroting the numbers of cases and the measures being taken, but it's all from the perspective that we must comply and ask for even more control. You know what this reminds me of? Some video game outbreak scenarios come to mind. One is Deus Ex, where the nanovirus, the Great Death, is used by the Majestic 12 as part of their plan to take over the world. You've got the plague, sir. You know, rich people don't get great death. Don't make me call security. Like Mr. Billionaire Bob Page. He don't have it. The president don't have it. I never seen a movie star who's got it. You don't have it. Wait your turn. You should be more appreciative. By helping you, this gentleman risks his own health. But he won't give me any medicine. Trust me, when there's a cure, the city will underwrite the cost. The virus threatens everyone. I don't believe you. And I won't hesitate to prescribe the treatment for you. You better not. <sighs> they say the plague came from monkeys, but that's not true. It was the army. It was the scientists. You don't see scientists getting sick. Rich people like Bob Page who own all the technology, they don't get sick. I think terrorists put Grey Death in the water. If you think you have Grey Death, please pick up an information packet. Plague victims can have their medication mailed to their homes at no additional cost. Our appointment to FEMA should be finalized within the week. I have already discussed the matter with the Senator. I take it he was agreeable? He didn't really have a choice. Has he been infected? Oh yes, most certainly. When I mentioned that we could put him on the priority list for the Ambrosia vaccine, he was so willing it was almost pathetic. This play, the rioting is intensifying to the point where we may not be able to contain it. Why contain it? Let it spill over to the schools and churches. Let the bodies pile up in the streets. In the end, they'll beg us to save them. The Majestic 12 used to be part of Illuminati's technology and communications branch, but then decide to do their own thing, and in the process take over the Illuminati, with Bob Page at the helm of the coup, who then becomes the most powerful man in the world, and serves as the main antagonist in the Deus Ex series. In this game, the virus has an infection rate between 25 and 30 percent, a mortality rate of 93 percent, and the only way to stop it is through the Ambrosia vaccine produced by Bob Page's VersaLife Corporation. Once exposed to the virus, it is demonstrated that beginning signs of infection result in flu-like symptoms, usually coughing. As the infection progresses to later stages, the individual turns pale, white-gray, hence gray death. It becomes increasingly frail, where speech can also be affected. Eventually, the individual would also experience severe pain throughout the body due to the virus eating away cells, which would inevitably cause the victim to succumb to death. By creating large amounts of great death and small amounts of ambrosia, Majestic 12 were able to force powerful individuals to carry out their bidding. For example, Bob Page placed an unnamed senator on the priority list for the vaccine in exchange for promoting Walton Simmons to position of director of FEMA. Majestic 12 also used the virus to create a state of emergency and to generally destabilize the world. Bob Page states that it would be extremely easy for him to create a new virus if a cure to the Great Death was to be found. 
In case you were wondering, Helios intercepted your transmission. We accessed the Ocean Lab computers ourselves, which means our UCs will be operational shortly. Meanwhile, we will be manufacturing a cure to the virus. A cure? A cure? Do you have any idea how easy it will be for me to make a new virus? All I have to do is find a very large prime number and multiply. And all we have to do is crack the code. Mathematically unlikely. Another game is The Division, where the smallpox variola chimera, commonly known as the dollar flu or green poison, is a genetically engineered super virus based on the disease smallpox, created with no functional vaccine or cure. This genetically augmented virus was manufactured by Dr. Gordon Amherst, a delusional, genocidal environmentalist and gifted virologist as a means of population control. What you're looking at is the smallpox virus, one of the deadliest pathogens on the planet. For centuries, it did a wonderful job of helping keep the human population in check. But times change, and sometimes Mother Nature needs a hand in improving her creations. Like, say, speeding them up a little bit making them contagious when they should be quietly incubating in a host, or making them more lethal. I didn't come up with the approach on my own. My friend Vitaly is one of the pioneers in the field, and the idea has been around for years. Genome as data. You see, once we digitize DNA, we made it infinitely mutable. We could do a thousand virtual variations in the time it used to take to grow a one lab grade generation of pathogens. And we could pick the best, most lethal combinations and make them real. That's how you make a killer virus, you see. Mix in genetic code from other diseases and you move the sliders all the way up on lethality and virulence. The goal was a 90% mortality rate. I'm not sure my green poison is going to quite hit that, but honestly, that's just details. As long as most of humanity goes, the Earth stands a fighting chance. Technically, technology is what's killing the planet. But that's not really the case. It's the greed that drives the technology. But a funny thing happened on the way to $100 genome maps and 3D printed plastic toys. Someone figured out those technologies could be repurposed modified for the greater good. Me. Now, my virus is gonna do what nature's always done. Decide who lives and who dies. And if nature decides I die, then I die. If nothing else, I'll have a lot of company. Natural selection at its finest helped along by a little unnatural genetic manipulation. It's all data, really. Life's just a method of processing it. The same way I processed the smallpox genome on my laptop. And who's to say that wasn't the plan all along? If, by some miracle, you survive green poison, then nature's decided you deserve to live. The rest of us shouldn't and won't. Godspeed. I'll see you in hell. 95% of the population is susceptible to the virus, but 5% are genetically immune. The disease was unleashed in New York City during a Black Friday by contaminated US dollar bills, with the virus being spread in several retail stores across Manhattan. Green poison is a weaponized super virus, based on original smallpox, not only does it incubate faster, but it is also infectious during the short incubation period, meaning it spreads between people with no initial symptoms and takes effect much more quickly. People infected with a green poison after the incubation period usually initially start to show symptoms similar to common influenza, so as to deceive the population and medical professionals into not realizing the danger until it is too late and the virus progresses rapidly, with infected dying quickly thereafter. Due to the virus ability to rapidly mutate, it is nearly impossible for conventional drugs or antibodies to identify and exterminate the virus, let alone creating a proper vaccine to the disease. 
It also allows the virus to adapt to a diverse population range such as New York City. There are some people who are naturally immune to catching this virus, but they are largely in the minority and as the virus is not symptomatic at first, people who could be immune are left to survive in quarantines and later dark zones. The Division and Deus Ex portray, in my opinion, plausible outbreak scenarios and they are both very good at predicting how martial law will take place and how civil war is brewed, with the particularity of Deus Ex to show that behind it all, some people in the shadows can still make a profit and are the master of puppets. For example, Mankind Divided. Look at the world today. There is much need of solidarity right now. And we need to find common ground to fight this, yet people are still obsessed with their politics and their tribal group think, focusing their energy in areas that really shouldn't be a priority right now. The dystopia scenario is no longer just in video games or movies. Overnight it has been brought in our lives and for me it's hard to tell what's going on. I find myself self-contradictory. On one hand I would like for people to be responsible and stay at home. And on the other, I dislike the fact that we are all losing our rights. We thought we were kings, we took a lot of things for granted. Only to realize now that at the whistle, we could all be locked up like sheep and not be able to do anything about it. I've never really felt any fear before, but now I fear. And not for the effects of the virus because the mortality rate is not that high, it's not as ugly as in those video games, but I fear for what new restrictions will come out of this how our society will be after this chaos goes away. Some people out there, just like the Majestic 12 in Deus Ex, like to reshape the order out of the chaos. They did it before, and they will do it again. We can't see what chess the masters of this world are playing, because we are not the players, we are the pawns. So I can't tell you who the enemy is, it's not a video game, there is no quest, no objective, all we can do is no matter what happens, Let's try and keep our humanity and spirit, stick together with our families and pray. Video games and movies teach you that you can fight with guns and I will actually recommend that you don't do that. In real life, there is no respawn. There are no health packs. The only fight is with your mind, heart and with your spirit. No one can take that away from you. Not even with torture, not even with a bullet. I did not take everything for granted, I enjoyed every moment, and I would still like to do that. But if they are arranging a world where we only sit in our rooms and later plugged into the Matrix, I'm not sure if I would subscribe to that. That would be the ultimate in slavery. So be aware of these things, my friends. Take these moments of solitude to think and get ready to fight for freedom. This is Vostov Vlad, signing out.